Thank you, everyone. Uh, before we begin, I would like to really start with a show of hands. How many of you rely on radio communication on your sides for safety? So a few people. How many of you rely on uh, lighting for navigation at night? Now, what if I told you that you could have one, but not the other? Surely you would all consider that this is ridiculous, and such lights would never end up on your mind sides, right? Yet, we see many operators who continuously complain that ever since they installed these bloody LEDs, they have to stop and turn the lights off to use radio communication. Now, let's stop and turn the lights off to use a vital piece of communication equipment. Since when has this become an acceptable norm? My name is Andrew, and this is Alex. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not deranged. Alex couldn't make it today, so it's just myself. <coughs> and today we're going to look at uh, electrical grade conditions. We're going to look at what is EMI? Where is it coming from? How does it affect me? Well, you and me, all of us. Does it affect us? And hopefully by the end of this short presentation, I only have 20 minutes, we'll be able to identify EMI, uh, look at a few issues, how to resolve it, and most importantly, hopefully we can avoid it altogether so we don't introduce the problem in the first place. So to better understand where EMI uh, electrical negative emissions are coming from and why they're becoming such a big issue these days, we need to look at the evolution of mining machinery. This presentation was targeted at mining machinery, but it's actually relevant across all the machinery. So, bear with me, you have to kind of translate it to your own relevance. So, if you look at the evolution of mining machinery, if you look at the past, this is a photo of uh, Caterpillar bulldozer from the 70s. As you can see, there's not much electronics on board. It's all pretty simple and straightforward and quite reliable. These things are still working today. So, EMI was not really an issue. This is a copy of modern D11 dozer. As you can see, it's packed full of electronics. It's got GPS navigation, data loggers, um, analog and digital sensors. And what's more important is these things are becoming critical today. So they as important as they could ever be. And in the very near future, we're going completely unmanned. Thank you, remote. <laughs> that means we're going to rely on electronics even more. So everything is going to be done completely remotely. So in comparison, let's look at the evolution of uh, industrial lighting. Incandescent and halogen lamps have been the key part of industrial lighting from the very beginning. In fact, it hasn't changed all that much. It's only in the last 10 years that we started to see high density discharge lamps being introduced to machines, and probably only in the last five years, LEDs are starting to get introduced to machines. Now let's look at the LEDs and how are they powered. Unlike lamps, LEDs are powered by current, they're not powered by voltage. So you need to supply a very specific current to the LED for it to operate properly. And this is the characteristics of uh, LED operational voltage versus current. If you vary the voltage just a little bit, the current varies dramatically. So it's a very important aspect for an LED manufacturer to supply the exact current that we need. So let's look at how LEDs are driven. There's pretty much two major methods, or two major ways of driving LEDs. First is a linear driver. The advantages has got absolutely zero emissions. It's pretty much just like a resistor sitting in line. The disadvantages of that is that it's got a narrow voltage range, so you can't make something that will work from this to this, and it will be very versatile. Uh, for that reason, it's not suitable for a variety of applications. And more, most importantly, because it's so uh, primitive, it's quite hard to make an efficient design. In the world of LED lighting, it's all about efficiency these days, so everyone's racing to make as efficient lighting as possible. Everyone wants to get the most lumens per watt, the most lumens per dollar. So the other option is to use a switch mode power supply. A switch mode power supply actually allows us to, do, to get exactly that. We can get huge efficiencies at very low costs. But the disadvantage of that Switch mode power supply basically switches between voltage mode and current mode very fast. The fact that faster it switches, the more efficient it is. But with these switches, we actually generate EMI emissions. This is not a new problem, it's been in existence exist for quite a while, so there is a communications and media authority that looks after it. And there is a mandatory electromagnetic compliance governed by the CISPA 15 directive. And CISPA 15 basically says that uh, the compliance is to be within a certain range. 
right? And the products that comply, which is mandatory, so technically all the products should wear the CTIC marks, or today it's RCM marks. But just because it's got a CTIC mark and an RCM mark doesn't mean that it actually comply, unfortunately. And EMI is not something simple, it's not something you can hear, feel, or see. So there's no magic tool that I can whip out of my pocket and measure it. The only way to really measure EMI is to submit it to a lab. In the EMI lab, that's um, a photo of EMI lab. And uh, it needs to be measured by people who are highly qualified to do that. So naturally, this is not a cheap process, and if it doesn't comply, you have to do it again and again and again. So many manufacturers, or many importers, I should say, um, just kind of take it for the face value of the land share of the parts that they're buying. So what are they actually measuring in those labs? They're looking at two types of emissions. There's the radiated emissions and the conductor emissions. So radiated emissions. When you're looking at these graphs, you can actually request these graphs from the test lab. This, this should be a part of our test report that's supplied to my teams. You're looking at the green line, which is the background noise levels. This is basically a measurement of, uh, this is a scan with the light being off. The blue line is the actual measurement of the light being on. And the dotted uh, purple line is the allowable limit. So as you can see, this fitting clearly doesn't pass the emission. This fitting, for example, <coughs> quite well pass the test. And this is typically what we see out there. So a lot of fittings are scanning exactly like that. In one spot, it could be just over, but then they take the quasi peak measurements, and if it's well within the limit, then it could pass. However, this is what happens. You need to watch out for communication noise floor. For those who don't, don't, uh, don't know what it is on this one. So, with the lights being off, the green chain there, that's a, you can't quite see it. That's a noise floor without the light hitting. This is something that happens out there, we cannot control it. We all learn to live with it. As soon as you install the light heating and turn it on, this particular light beam, this is your new noise floor. And if your communication signal is that strength and is just under the new noise floor, you have no reception or you have no communication. So by choosing to use this particular fitting, you're putting yourself at risk of running into more communication issues. This is an example of a blue fitting. That's actually our fitting. <laughs> um, well, this, is, uh, this has taken us six months. Uh, it's a 300 watt fitting, so it's extremely challenging. It's taken us six months to achieve that. And it's extremely uh, tricky. We're talking about fast flow transfers and back to work on it quite diligently. Uh, but this is what you're looking for. Ideally, a fitting that's as close to the background as possible. Another thing to note is that there's vertical and horizontal polarization of the emissions as well. So if you turn the antenna 90 degrees, you'll actually get a different fitting. So that's handy when you're trying to fix it. And there's conducted emissions. Conducted emissions are actually easier to deal with because there's filters and um, the views filters are nice isolate in different circuits. So there's other ways. I'm going to get back to it a little bit later. Now, there is almost an epidemic out there to retrofit LEDs. This is not so much in the industrial world, but it's actually in our world. Everybody is rushing to retrofit LEDs and say. Um, particularly, this is um, th this is a problem because you're taking, uh, let's say that down there for example, but we don't have it in our houses, but you're taking something that didn't emit noise in the first place, which transformed it to emit a very little noise, and you're replacing it with another light that emits very little noise and transformed it emits little noise. But when you put them together, they actually behave in a very strange ways, and same as fluorescent replacements. In fact, uh, retrofitting as a concept is very cheap way of replacing your lights for a benefit. So predominantly, this is because it's so cheap, it's so attractive to the masses. And as it's attractive to the masses that know nothing about EMI, it's almost become an epidemic. Let's use a scenario that we're all familiar with. Let's imagine you live in an apartment and um, you come home every night and you like to watch D1 or D1 TV at 7 o'clock. It's not seven if it's 7 o'clock or not, but uh, let's just go with it. Let's just say, hypothetically, your neighbor uh, last yesterday replaced his, uh, his downlights with LEDs. Now you come home at 7 o'clock, turn it on, and you have no reception. All of a sudden, you don't actually know that your neighbor replaced the downlights. Um, the interesting thing is that digital TVs, as we recently switched to completely digital, actually handle in a very funny way because 
yes, they have error corrections, but once it crosses a third, certain threshold, the signal becomes completely unrecognizable, so it just stops. Um, I've taken this photo from my TV with one downlight that was on the other end of the house that just you turn it on and an analog TV you could still see it and you could actually see the computer stuff through. It's not just one person that's affected, it's actually everyone around them that's affected. So you may not even know that your neighbor's done that. And what's really challenging about the TV thing in particular is that um, so say you have no reception, in the morning you call the TV guy, the antenna guy, he turns up and says everything's fine because the neighbor turned the lights off, but then you come back home again, the neighbor comes back, turns the lights on, and again, you lost your signal. So this is like, and knowing about this and knowing what to check, and this is kind of part of the reasons why I'm doing this presentation is really educational, to let you guys know that these things happen, and next time you face it, you could spend hundreds of hours trying to chase the problem without knowing what the problem is. So this is one of the first signs, and this is how you identify. So at home, obviously, the TV signal the perception and so on, the radio. Uh, at work, uh, if we talk back to mining and machinery, this could result in, uh, say, one of the machines working quite well here, but then going over the hill in a particular example, not working there at all. So this, it, it, it results in a very unexpected ways, but um, it's quite, once you know what to look for, it's quite easy to identify. So when we look at the how to resolve EMI problems, we need to look at it as a system approach. So there's two things, there's a source and then there's a victim. So it's the source that influences the victim. First we could uh, try to improve, it's probably the easiest thing to do, is to improve the victim's EMI immunity. So for example, if you had a, you've got a LED light on the roof of the dozer and then you've got a GPS antenna in the middle. If you have a cable for the GPS antenna going close to the lights, what you could do is you could actually try to reroute the cable further away from the lights. That's, and quite often that could solve the problem. If you can't do that, then naturally you need to go back to the source and see if you can reduce the emissions from the source. So first you probably check for conducted EMIs, because conducted EMIs is quite easy to fix, remember we covered it earlier. So the first thing you do is if your light is sitting on the same circuit as the GPS or whatever the equipment is affected, you actually remove the light from the circuit and you put it in the remote battery and you see how it reacts because 90% of the time it will stop. Um, you can use shielded cables, so for example we use shielded cables because it helps us not just physically prevent the uh, unit from damage, but we also prevent the uh, EMI. And you can use the EMI filter, one of the, my favorite, you can actually put it in the box. Uh, if it's a certain device you can, with light, you can't exactly put them in the box. Or you can put a metal cage around it. You can relocate the wiring pool, and you can do many more things. But one of the hardest things is to actually identify. So what can we do to avoid it in the first place? Um, I think the smartest thing to do would be to ask for an EMC test report. So these are the, in particular, you don't need to look at the whole report, you're really looking for the scans and you're looking at the noise floor level. If, if it's really high, it doesn't mean it's a bad product, but you really need to assess on how critical uh, it is to the operation of this particular uh, machine. We usually uh, suggest for um, to, to be extremely careful with machines that work underground where there's very low communication levels, uh, the signal is very weak. Uh, but one of the easiest things we do is actually, since we can't detect it, but we can sometimes hear it on an AM or FM ra uh, radio band, so you just take a portable radio or a CD radio and you can scan right next to the light, this is pretty much as, as worse as it gets to the light, as bad as it gets. So you can uh, wave it around the light, and quite often, if it's in the, uh, a fitting that emits EMI, it will you'll hear some sort of interference on the radio. So that gives you a quick overview. It's not look, it's not a life critical problem. It is a nuisance, as uh, uh, somebody once told me, and I completely agree with nuisance. And the more, most important thing, the main thing to take away from this is that uh, you need to be aware of this and. Uh, once you are aware of this, you will know what to do. Thank you. Any questions? I think this problem here is one that's sneaking into our life. Um, and it started most probably somewhere around about five, ten years ago. Being an amateur radio operator, we've seen that noise level over the last 10 years go up to a level where it's nearly not impossible to in fact be able to establish a, a reliable communication plan. 
And uh, yeah, with good design, this doesn't have to be there, but it is your cheaper lines coming into the country and not being controlled because the governments have decided to take that regulatory side down um, and it's self regulatory. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's good that I, can, I see you uh, working towards getting that lower level. Um, we just wish a lot more to do it. Thank you. Good talk.